I'm a Mexican researcher and I did my um, my PhD in the University of Manchester, so I will present uh, the work I did during my PhD. Um, I was going to be a brief talk about organic semiconductors and how it's going towards an environmental panic synthesis and processing of these components for electronic devices. So firstly, um, conjugated polymers can be defined as an organic macromolecules that are characterized by the presence of delocalized high electrons on the backbone change. In 1977, Shirakawa and co-workers discovered the conductivity of the polyacetylene and how this behaved differently if it was the cis or the trans isomer. Before this discovery, the people would used to think of polymers as insulators. This, this discovery was a milestone for organic semiconductors. And now we can, nowadays, we can see these polymers in applications in electronic devices such as organic solar cells, organic light and mutant diodes, and organic field effect transistors. So I'm going to talk about this a bit more. Since this discover, several research has been driving to understand the, chem the chemical structure and how this affect the properties of the semiconductor, the side chain engineering, the molecular weight of the polymers, the morphology and the process and how to process these materials. For a long time, the, the source of these polymers were, were polycetylene, uh, PPB polymers, which, is, which are polyphenylene, vinylene, and polythiophenes. And one of the main polymers of these uh, polythiophenes is PTHD. So, in the research of the chemical structure, the researchers have been looking through improve how to improve the semiconductor properties, either optical or trans charge transport properties, um, and how the side chain engineering could affect the, on these properties. Also. One of the key advantages of this polymer, of the, the organic semiconductors over inorganic semiconductors is the processing. We can do um, solution processing with these materials and you cannot do that with inorganic semiconductor or not that easily at least. This there's the continuous research lead to a new kind of materials that are copolymers with donor and acceptor units. This is a very important pro uh, uh, progress in polymer semiconductors because this allows to tune the highest, the highest occupied molecular orbital and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, the homo and lumo levels. With this, we can tune the band gap, which means, or in other words, we can play with the polymer and modify the band gap to allow uh, uh, to allow the excitation of a ground state to an excitated state with a lower amount of energy. In other words, could be for in for instance for organic um, for solar cells, you require a less amount of energy to generate a charge uh, charge transfer. Um, I'm going to talk about about the research I did with uh, Dr. Kwanduri and Professor Turner's group of poly of the ring opening polymerization of paracyclophendiene's copolymers with uh, benzotiazole units. This is a very educational research because you first um, I need to I need to say that Dr. Kwanduri did a great work with the synthesis of the monomers of these monomers. And after the polymerization, uh, the ring opening polymerization of these of these molecules, and we with 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 the Grubbs three catalyst that is in the scheme three. When you can when you control the ratio between monomer and initiator, you can actually control how the molecular weight increase. 
So as you can see in the table one in the entry 8A, with a ratio of one to 10, of 10 to one, you can actually have a polymer with 10 units, with 10 repetitive units of this donor acceptor uh, conformation. And if you increase that the ratio to 20, you're going to have 20 repetitive units and so on. So you can see how the work was done primarily with two kinds of monomers, with an alkoxy group and an alkyl one. In your right side, you will see how the molecular weight increased linearly according to the, what was expected, according to the calculation done previously. What's a nice, the molecular weights behave nicely and also you can have a narrow dispersity in, and very, very good yields. Another important thing to observe in this kind of polymers is can, can be observed in the optical properties. And this is how, an, exam, an excellent example, the how the, the side chains can modify or affect the optical property, opticals and, elect, and elect, optoelectrical properties of these polymers. If you see the maximum absorption peak of the alkoxic polymer is about 500 nanometers. Meanwhile, the alkyne one is below 500 nanometers, which means that you require less energy to go to an next day state with the alkoxy polymer than the energy you require to excitate the alkyne one. But not just that, this was also, the polymer obtained is a cis-trans alternating polymer. However, with a photoisomerization with UV light, we can isomerize from the cis-trans uh, polymer to the full trans polymer. This is going to rearrange the backbone of the polymer, affecting the optical and electronic properties. So with the reorganization, we're going to see and then how the maximum absorption peak increase in both cases, which mean again, that the energy to excitate these polymers is reduced. Another, in another way, another way to say this, we can play with the minimum amount of energy that we require to, to pass from a ground state to an excitated state. So, this kind of polymers, this chain road living polymerization allows us pass first, do a control the molecular weight of the polymer, have narrow polydispersities, and go from the cis trans conformation to the full trans conformation with these PPB and BT unit polymers. And also, one of the main advantage of the, this kind of polymerization is that you will have minimal backbone effects. That is important when you are working with uh, donor acceptor polymer. So, how this is a very educational research that was published recently. However, the current research is more focused in this kind of polymers, as you can see in the right side. As you can see, there are more complex structures, and usually these kind of polymers are, have two main synthetic approaches or synthetic ways, which is still polymerization or Suzuki polymerization. Both requires functionalization of one of the monomers and make it react with halide monomer. And this reacts in the presence of a catalyst, usually palladium, not necessarily palladium, but usually palladium, to, for a, to give this donor acceptor um, polymers. Recently, one of the approaches that have gained a lot of, of focus is the direct layer polymerization. And all of these synthetic approaches has their um, advantage and disadvantage. In the case of stilipary immunization is probably the most um, 
um, the most efficient reaction between among the isomers. However, the, there are, this kind of polarization have highly toxic derivatives. The stannates are really toxic. So we want to avoid this kind of uh, reactions. So Siki and the other, on the other way, have is the conditions like Mulder, the um, side products and the boronic acids are not toxic or not at least that toxic, How, uh, but usually gives a lower molecular weight and can have occasionally uh, backbone defects. And direct group polymerization do not use functionalized uh, monomers. However, you, the homocoupling defects are really high on this kind of polymerization and they're not that easy to control. So there's this kind of polymerization is still in development. So I will say that nowadays the, the steel Suzuki and acyl polymerization are the main ways to synthesize these kind of polymers. Uh, below, so how are we going to, if I want to fabricate a device, which is are the steps that I need to take? First, first is the polymer design. I need to design the polymers according to the needs of my future device. After I design the polymer, I need to select the best approach, the best synthetic approach for both, for, for polymer synthesis and the monomer synthesis. And after that, in each step, you need to do an isolation and purification of your product. And once you have the bulk polymer, you need to solubilize in an organic solvent to be deposited in a substrate or to fabricate the device, the decided device. Um, however, I must mention that for these steps, at least for the polymer solubilization prior to the deposition of the substrate, you, the most common solvents used are allogenated solvents, which are highly toxic and undesirable in the current chemistry and the current sustainable approach of the chemistry. So one of the one of the, the, the desires in the current chemistry is avoid these allogenated aromatic solvents. Try to use non-allogenated aromatic, but ideally use non-toxic solvents and the more environmental friendly solvent, which will be water and alcohols. So, uh, sorry. So how can I reduce, how can we reduce the use of these organic solvents? Currently, there are different approaches for, to achieve this. Uh, some approaches are the solvent-free polymerization. This is basically polymerization solvent, solid state, which has certain limitations because you only can work with certain kind of monomers and you will not have um, a, a wide range of uh, possible uh, polymers to synthesize it through this way. Another way, another, um, another solution is the side chain modification of the polymers. And with this approach, what the people have done is incorporate ionic, um, ionic side chains or polar side chains. This allows the solubility of these polymers in more polar solvents. And recently, there is several publications of this kind of polymer solving either alcohols or water, which is really nice. However, this approach is, the synthesis is still in, the synthesis is exactly the same. You dissolve in an organic solvent, you uh, render the polymerization as usual, and the verification will be actually the same with the same process, but it usually is subtlex extraction, which is a washing with several solvents for a long period of time. And, but ultimately, the polymer will be soluble in water. Another approach is the conjugated polymer nanoparticles, which is an emulsification of the polymers. So you solubilize your polymer in a minimum amount of organic solvent to promote an emulsification in an aqueous media that, is, uh, that has a uh, surfactant content. So these will generate micelles where your polymers are going to be inside and you will have the polymer 
in a dispersion of water and you can process this. There is a couple of drawbacks here. The main drawback is that this kind of emulsions, at least until three years ago, five years ago, all the devices that were trying to be done using conjugated polymer particles had a terrible performance. Usually the people attribute this to the surfactant that was actually as a charged color trap. Um, in the other way around, we can have all that. We can actually synthesize the polymer with this, with the emulsion polymerization. Emulsion polymerization habits is widely new since, I will say, after the Second World War, when it was become an in industrial synthetic approach for rubber. However, for in a specific Suzuki emulsion polymerization, the first report was until the 2000. 12 my Cunet and co-workers and they synthesize a polyfluorine family as you can see in the in the scheme a in the scheme 5a this was the family that they synthesized using emulsion polym suzuki emulsion polymerization however compared with conventional methods the yields were lower at least 20 percent lower but was but it was a good progress in terms of a more using water as a main um, solvent for the re for the polymerization. In 2014, uh, Turner, Professor Turner Group published a series of polyfluorines with a high, with a really good yields and a really nice result with another family of polyfluorines, but using microemulsion polymerization. The difference between microemulsion and mini-emulsion polymerization relies in the amount of surfactant used. So when you use um, microemulsion polymerization requires more surfactant. Meanwhile, mini-emulsion polymerization requires less surfactant. And also the way um, the particles are formed in a different way. Microemulsion use mechanical stirring and mini-emulsion is helped by uh, high shear energy, which is sonication. So you syndicate the, your two phases, the organic phase and the aqueous phase to generate the emulsion. So, as I said, the first reports of devices using nanoparticles, conjug of conjugated polymer nanoparticles, gave really low performance. But it was in 2015, when Chang Group reported a screening of how different surfactants could affect the performance of uh, the devices with the same polymer. And they argued that SDS was the worst surfactant that you could use because it gave the, a really, really poor results. And they, they they, had, they arrived to the conclusion that CPAP surfactants were the best, the best family of surfactants to achieve good mobilities for OFETS devices. Um, they continued this work and they achieved really, really, really good results with this approach, which they first do the synthesis of the, of the conjugated polymer in a conventional way either Suzuki or the Stilo uh, as required according to the polymer. They isolate and purify. They got the bulk polymer. They really solve the organic solvent. And you can either, according to the amount you use, treat it directly over the tin film or form conjugated polymer nanoparticles mixing the organic phase with the polymer and an aqueous phase with a surfactant to form the conjugated polymer and then aqueous process this polymer. So what they achieve, you see in the tables below, they achieve for first time mobilities comparable from the conjugated polymer particles in the same order of magnitude than the ones processed by solution by organic solution. 
usually what the people reported was one or two, even three orders of magnitude lower when conjugated polymer nanoparticles were used. Now they achieve, they were like five times lower than the organic, the organic ones, but in the same order of magnitude, which again was a great progress. And this was just three years ago. So this is where our research, where we propose a new way, a, a new protocol, a new process to obtain, to fabricate devices with organic electronics. And our proposal was from the many motion polymerization of the monomers form the motion, allows the polymer grow inside a, the core of the nanoparticles, and then direct process, directly process that nanoparticles into, oil, into substrates to fabricate devices, specifically OFETs. For this, we first start with synthesis, with emulsion synthesis. We select two of them, two really good polymers, semiconductor polymers. Uh, one is DPP-BT and the other one is IDTBT. These are widely studied and they have, they have shown really good results in organic, in, on, in OFATs. So a screening of these polymerizations were done in minimum evolution polymerization. And as you will see in the table five, uh, the volume ratio between, these are observable, these are done by Suzuki Miyagura polymerization. So the ratio between the organic and the aqueous phase, usually when you do a common or a Suzuki polymerization, you go between two to one, four to one, three to one, organic aqueous phase, always being the main solvent, the organic one. But with minimotion, you have the opposite, and you have one to 10, so one milliliter of the organic phase and 10 milliliters of the aqueous phase. This will, this is a really high concentrated uh, reaction, but it will allow you, according to with this, uh, with this, um, with this amount will allow you, if the reaction succeed, 10, 10 milligrams per milliliter of uh, solution, 10 milligrams of the polymer per milliliter of the aqueous, the aqueous suspension, which is one way percent. This one way percent is the same amount of uh, weight percent that the people use when they solubilize the bulk polymer in an organic solvent and then deposit over the devices. So, and I, as I said, the screening of these reactions were done. And one of the things that you need to take in account is like in DVP PVT, the base was changed to sodium hydroxide instead of potassium carbonate. As, and this is because the SDS that we, we select SDS uh, surfactant because it's one of them gives the most stable particles and is wider and there is a lot of information about this surfactant so it's easy to work with so the problem is that with potassium salt the SDS form a potassium salt and precipitate if this precipitate the nanoparticles are going to collapse they're either aggregate or simply the polymer is going to precipitate and also an uh, interesting finding was for IDTVT, we could reduce the reaction for this in, in, in minimum emulsion to 55 degrees. Um, so we can and achieve similar molecular weights for uh, com when we compare with the uh, conventional method and emulsion and polymerization, we actually gave this very, very similar molecular weights and polydisper uh, dispersities, which is actually really good. So after this, we need to characterize and purify these conjugated polymer nanoparticles before use um, into the, to fabricate devices. One of the main things is the amount of surfactant use. We have 7.5 milligrams per milliliter of surfactant when we when we 
calculate and 10 milligrams of the polymer per milliliter of, of, of the suspension, which means we have almost 50 percent, uh, well, a bit less than 50 percent of our mass is going to be surfactant. We don't want that because it's going to act as a charged, charged prop, which is going to give poor performance in the device. So a way to, bore, to a way, to, a way to solve this problem and also to remove the berries and remove the side, the side products of the reaction that are soluble in water, we opt to do a dialysis purification. So we screen the dialysis process by several methods and one of them was, as you're going to see in the figure A, by thermal analysis. So you inject the, the conjugated polymer nanoparticles in a dialysis cassette. You, you can just let it in water and every, every certain time, in this case 12 hours, we exchange the water and replenish the water to help the dialysis process continue. And as you can see in the TGA plots, um, this, this first onset at about 200 degrees is the um, discomposition temperature of the SDS. And this onset, uh, above 400 degrees, correspond to the polymer. So you can see similar trends in both polymers. And you can see how, as we, as the time passes on the dialysis process, the amount of surfactant is reduced. So at the end, after 72 hours, which is three days, which is comparable with the time of some people use for sucks like extraction in the conventional method, we reduce by in two thirds the amount of uh, surfactant. And was a, this was a this was really important for the future experiments. Also, we check the stability of the particles. We can see that the particle size and the polydispersity of the particles size remains the same over the time after in the, during the dialysis process, which means the particles are stable. So even when we remove the excess of surfactant use, the particles will be will remain stable and or conjugated nanoparticles dispersion will will be suitable for other purposes. In the figure 10, what we did was take a sample of this after dialysis nanoparticle, and then an EL215 degrees over 30 minutes to remove all the remaining surfactant. This was to see how much of the remaining material was actually polymer. So as you can see, we still can see a small steps and we can see the, how we have 94 or 97 according to the polymer, the DPP 97 and IDTVT 94. This remaining percentage of organic compound that discompose around 250 actually corresponds when you compare to the composition temperature of the monomer, of the monomers. So we can have a, an, an approximately we can extract the yield, an approximated yield from this data, and we could, like, we could assume that it's over 90% conversion. So after that, we start to, to study how to deposit the nanoparticles into a substrate to fabricate the device. This represents a challenge because the anarchist phases of this Usually the devices are either hydrophobic or if you make them hydrophilic, you will have another problem. You will going to wet really good the substrate because it's going to like the water. However, the polymer itself is hydrophobic. So you're, going, you're not going to attach the polymer. You're going to coat with water, but not the polymer. So there is a couple of tricky steps there that we need to study. Um, however, our, in the first attempt, as you can see in the EFM results, um, we didn't achieve a uniform 
film, but at least it helps us to study the particle size of the nanoparticles obtained. As you can see, the, the particles have a granular look like or globular. But with the same server, with the server of FM, we could calculate the particle size of these nanoparticles, and they actually are really close to the obtainment in the DLS data. You can, you can see the histogram uh, for the PPVT, it's around 100 nanometers, and for IDTVT, around 70 nanometers. So the DLS and the, the um, AFM that data match. So again, now, how to deposit this polymer in, into substrate? Well, a solution that we find um, was make hydrophilic the, surf, uh, the surface of the substrate hydrophilic. So you will have a deposit of this uh, conjugated polymer nanoparticles, but these are not going to be attached to the substrate itself. To make them attach, you need to uh, immediately anneal the polymer. So here we, you can see more AFM results. In the figure A, this is for uh, DPP, DPPT VT. In the, in the figure A, you will see the conjugated nanoparticles films. In the B, it's going to be the polymer obtained from the conjugated, polymer, poly, conjugated polymer nanoparticles, but after precipitating methanol and after obtaining the bulk polymer. This is bulk polymer from conjugated polar nanoparticles. And C is the bulk polymer, but from the conventional method. As you can see, in both methods gives after um, precipitate and resolubilize in an organic solvent, the results are similar and correspond with the literature. The DPP TBT forms a fiber-like, um, has a fiber-like morphology. However, for the conjugate polymer particles, we got this granular of this nanoparticle-like um, morphology. After the annealing step, this is as cas. After an annealing step, there is no real change between the bulk in the solution ones. But after an annealing step and a wash with methanol, with an alcohol in general, we can see how the bond, certain boundaries you cannot see clearly the boundaries now of the particles. This leads us to think that we are removing the remaining surfactant that is in between these particles with this washing step. Um, well, and we did the same with IDTVT. As you can see for the, the polymer and the nanoparticles, we see again this granular, this granular morphology and the pulse polymers are both basically the same. IDTVT is known as an amorphous polymer, and after the annealing process, something that was interesting was that after the annealing washing process, you can, you can see a more uniform film, and this granular, well, the polymer and the particle shape is fully disappear. You have a film, so a more homogeneous film. So, this was really interesting and also allows us to go to a second stage of, the, of this um, research, which was fabricate, fully fabricated device. So these devices were fabricated with a top gate bottom contact um, architecture. And we can see here on top, the bulk polymers, uh, the bulk uh, the devices made in with bulk polymer using the conventional method as is reported. You see a nice behavior, a uh, device behavior. You can see in the output, the output and transfer, the, the transfer curves behaves really nicely. Um, for DPP TBT, there was no real change. We see a really nice behavior when the nanoparticles are cast and after washing step, they even increase the performance. However, for IDT BT devices, we can see that without the washing step, we don't have um, device-like behavior. 
we need to do the wash step, which means we need to remove that bit of remaining surfactant on top with this wash to achieve and to have um, proper device behavior. So uh, another way to see that uh, we extract the data from these plots and we summarize, and I we summarize this data here. So you can see a comparison between the polymerization method, the bulk or conventional method, and the process set from, in this case, was chlorobenzene. Again, usually these polymers are soluble just in halogenated solvents. It's hard to avoid that. And the mini emulsion. But the mini emulsion was divided into once was precipitated with methanol and after to obtain the bulk polymer, resolubilizing chlorobenzene solution. And the other one was mini emulsion polymerization and, di and I direct the position of these nanoparticles over the substrates to the device. It was the same process for IDT, EVT, and DPPVT. What was remarkable was that we actually could achieve not just the same order of magnitude, it's almost the same performance and just half of the, a bit lower, but, layer, but a bit less than half of the performance of mobilities obtained by the bulk polymers. Another way to see in the, in the your right side is like, it's a more um, easy way to see that. The AQS performance are in the same order magnitude and the same range than the the ones that are done treated by the same by or by the conventional method. But you can see for both polymers we have a similar trend. We achieve functional devices, but now it's just functional devices, devices that actually behave in the same order of the magnitude and almost with the same performance that the organic that the one processes by or, by organic um, solution. And as you can see in this low part, these are the results of the devices without the washing step. So here we can see that actually the washing step is a key step to improve the performance of the devices when SDS is used as a surfactant because it's still remaining on the nanoparticles. So a way to see this this is a summary of what we can achieve in terms of a more environmental friendly process. First is the synthesis. We reduce the amount of the of organic solvent, in this case, on both cases, toluene, to one milliliter of the synthesis. We do not use any solvent for the purification method of this dialysis. We only use water. Compared with the conventional method, we you usually require more salt, more organic solvent in the synthesis step. And the purification step requires, again, usually salt like extraction with different solvents, for instance, methanol, hexane, and chlorobenzene, and chloroform, or other solvents that depend dependent of the polymer, with at least 100 milliliters of each one in different cells. And, this, and in terms of time, it's the same. You leave overnight, washing overnight with each solvent. So you will have, in terms of time, they are almost the same, or I would say the same. And for the processing, you really solve the polymer in an halogenated solvent or in another organic solvent. And, but with the conjugate polymer, because we deposit directly this, this AQ suspension. But, and the only amount, extra amount of uh, organic solvent that we use is for the washing step, an extra, the extra washing step to increase the performance of the device. So in an overall, um, in an overall point of view, we can see how the total volume of the organic solvent of the conventional method is, will be about 300 milliliters for this kind of process. And if we compare with what we achieve with this mini emulsion uh, approach, polymerization and direct processing, we're only using for a substrate or a spin coat, for one substrate, a spin coated, only 1.25 milliliters of organic solvent. 
and they are toluene, which is a non-halogenated solvent, and ethanol or methanol, this is an alcohol in the end, that can actually then is as long as a small amount and is one of the green solvents, one of the considered green solvents in, in the current chemistry. So in conclusion, we achieve an efficient synthesis to device process for organic semiconductor phase of transistor using a more environmental banning IQS approach for all the kits report for all the key steps reported. When you get the partner number two particles of IDTVT at a p-type polymer, we compare the p-type polymer, which is IDTVT, and n-type polymer, that is DPPVT. Um, both were successfully synthesized by this method. The conversions were high and, and the molecular weights were comparable with the conventional method. So we didn't compromise the molecular weight or the, or the polydispersity. And after, the, the conjugate polymer were stable and uniform in terms of size. The size was uniform, when with, I mean, low polydispersities, and they were stable. And we achieve use an efficient removal of the remaining surfactant, both with dialysis, with the dialysis process, and with the help of this spin wash uh, step after the thin film formation. So, and besides that, we wanted to prove, we wanted to prove this as a proof as a proof a principle that the polymer conjugated polymer particles were suitable to fabricate organic fuel effect transitions. However, uh, gladly we can see that they are just useful for that. They actually have the same real, almost the same behavior than the polymer than the devices uh, fabricated from the conventional methods and conventional processes which is organic solvent uh, processing. So if we see numbers, we could say that there is an, over a 99% of reduction of the use of organic solvents when we compare this method to the conventional synthesis to device approach, um, thinking of in the same scale of uh, amount of polymers, like we obtain 100 milligrams of, of the polymer per 10 milliliters of water, and we obtain 100 milligrams with the other approach. Um, I will mention that also this approach allows ten to give you 10 milliliters of the suspension. If you only use pour, um, 0 0.5 milliliters of per substrate, you could do almost, you could reach 200 devices. I will say that it's a bit um, adventurous to say it, but at least I will say you could do with one emulsion synthesis, you at least will have enough material to have a hundred substrates, spin code, spin code substrates by with this characteristic like two by two centimeter um, substrates. So thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, I hope to see you soon.